us, Nick, about what's going on with um, creative advertising. Oh, I will. So, uh, so that's us, um, uh, and that's us, and, uh, and, and that's the title of the uh, presentation, which uh, interestingly is probably the most generic title I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and it's because, like all of these things, we get asked to speak, and we say, we'll get you the title in a, in, you know, next week, and we never do, so they put a placeholder in. And so this is a placeholder title. <laughs> So we just work with it. I mean, it's, it's pretty broad. So I think if we just looked at these two words and decided what they meant, like the first thing is advertising, let's start there. So the, all of these changes that we're talking about have really affected the advertising industry as much as the publishing industry, as much as every other industry. Um, and one of the issues in, in our industry in particular is that there's this sort of guild mentality, this great sentiment, sentimental sort of attachment to, uh, to advertising as like a proxy for Hollywood. So. Um, but we know that sort of media has made advertising something else, completely different. Um, and so uh, as an agency, um, we sort of recognize that the intention of advertising for the last 50 years is pretty much the same, and that's, and that's this, right? We're, we're going to try to use media to sell stuff. Um, but the sort of characteristics of media have changed so drastically that how we do that is very different. And it, and it may not involve the same people, may not involve uh, the same sort of deliverables. Um, so uh, there's always uh, a product in the middle of, of, of everything we do. We have clients that want to sell a product. Now, in the past, uh, that product has mostly been an object, um, uh, and more and more it's, uh, it becomes an experience. And in fact, it's very interesting to listening to team talk about um, the, the, the sort of paywall. I think at the beginning, the reason that the paywall uh, was something that was given, uh, wasn't even considered was that we're, you know, we're selling newspapers. That's the thing that we're selling. And this strange thing called the web that is living on the margins, that's just like a service that, that's going to get people to buy in the object. And I think there's a whole lot of industries that have made that mistake. Obviously, music was the first to really get completely and utterly fucked, right? When they, when they thought that they were trying to sell CDs as opposed to music. And, and uh, Borders thought they were selling books, they were selling reading. Kodak thought they were selling uh, uh, film, they were, they were selling imaging. And in each case, not being able to distinguish between the object and the experiences was a big problem. So if we start with a, with a product, you know, uh, historically, our role as, as agencies was to do communications about that product so that people would go and buy it. Uh, but but uh, this sort of the encroachment of software into every nook and cranny of our lives means that these two things are now connected and uh, connected in a, in a blurred way by, by this sort of software service. Um, but for us as an agency, the interesting thing about these three things is that they've all become media. Software is media. You know, we're, we're surrounded by this sort of membrane of, of, uh, of screens where we deliver all these things, and they're all close together and meshed together. So not only uh, 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 do we do communications, but often we actually build products and we, and we, and we create services that enable those products um, through media, right? Which is why we're doing it, because, you know, we're... So, so but the, th the thing for us is that we... We gen in many cases, we start with a product. How are we going to enhance our clients' products? How are we going to help grow their business and then communicate afterwards? So we've sort of inverted um, the sort of order of how we go about things. And the, the, the fuel band that was mentioned is, is, uh, is the first sort of case study I'm going to show you here. So I can get a, a drink of water. Here it is. This is the Nike Plus fuel band, made to inspire anyone to be more active. Its foundation is a universal system of measurement called fuel. Unlike calories, fuel lets you compare yourself with anyone, no matter what their body type is or what they're doing. The fuel band is the device you wear that tracks everything you do. One button lets you check your stats. LED lights change from red to yellow and then to green when you hit your goal. Motivation is the core of the experience. To make sure fuel is something people want to use and share every day, competition and celebration are built in. As we experimented with the algorithm behind fuel and the design of the experience, our work gave us an insight we felt summed up the fuel band story. Everything you do counts. Can you count, suckers? At launch, this became the campaign that introduced fuel to the world. From the moment they put it on in the morning, users are constantly interacting with the fuel band and the service that drives it. 
They are sharing more, talking about the brand more, and spending more on Nike products. Fuel has fundamentally changed Nike's business as well. From a marketer of athletic shoes to a company whose products and services work together in a system of value for consumers, and whose mission has become an obsession with using technology to make every athlete better. This is the Nike Plus Fuel Band. So Nike's not just selling a, uh, a piece of hardware there, they're selling the experience, obviously, and the experience is delivered through software. Um, so the, ne the next word is creative, and, uh, and the, in, from, a, from, from an agency point of view, what's interesting is the, the, how different that has become too, the process, the people you need, and also the sort of what we deliver as creatives uh, lives in so many contexts. So because we, we have to manage this incredible complexity in media now, we like to create these, uh, these sort of frameworks that help us, that give us a sort of uh, a North Star. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, give you a, a Venn diagram here. You probably haven't seen any Venn diagrams today. This might be the first. Um, but it's very instructive for us uh, as we try to sort of manage all the possibilities. And there's always this tension between possibilities and simplicity. And so these, sort of, these, these frameworks help us sort of uh, understand how to make things simple. And the interesting thing about media is it's sort of divided between you know, the, the story, which is what's being delivered, and a system which is actually the media that's created uh, uh, to deliver it. And as, a, as an agency, we're involved in both sides. Historically, of course, it used to be just stories that agencies uh, uh, had creatives uh, working against. But now we have just as many people that think systematically as we do the people think narratively. Uh, and the relationship between these two things is also very important which is why we need a Venn diagram. Um, so historically, uh, you know, the agencies really, the, the sort of media moment that they, that they created was entertainment because they delivered the advertisement, the interruption, uh, generally in advertising mediums. And TV, of course, was the, is, is the model that, that, that sort of grew advertising into the into mega business it is. And there are still instances where that media moment uh, needs to be satisfied by marketers. So there is this uh, TV spot that Wyden and Kennedy did for the fuel band. Can you count, suckers? So that's successful at making me feel something about the brand, and that was enough in the past. Um, and with the advent of the internet, of course, uh, often we go straight to the search field in Google to find out about, <coughs> about a product or something. So at the other end of the spectrum from pure story is, is uh, in, on the system side, is pure information. Um, and what you do, the, the fuel ban itself is media as an enablement. So it's, it's media that, that is part of the product and helps me get stuff done. It has nothing to do with me being entertained as, a sort of, as an audience. It has everything to do with me uh, getting stuff done as a user. Um, and, as, and, and as soon as you start making things uh, that are, are complex software to get, help you get stuff done, like apps or, uh, or connected devices, then, then you, the mode of storytelling needs to change a little bit. You need to be more demonstrative. And I think Apple is a great example of this. Most of their ads are incredibly simple and elegant demonstrations of an interface and showing what you can do. And what we find is that the mode of storytelling that was the sort of currency of our industry for 50 years, which was metaphor that made you feel something, uh, often doesn't work when you're trying to sell an enabling technology. So that's just another media moment that uh, you know we've done lots of demonstrations around the fuel ban. Obviously, if you go to the website, then you can get information about the fuel ban. But there is this sort of magic of where these two worlds intersect, the story and the system. Um, and it's, it's play, right? And, and how we would define that is that 
it's a system within which we create the opportunity for a user to play, right? And I think that, that it's a sort of primal need for us to have agency over the things that we interact with, and, and so the success of things like social media and the gaming industry have everything to do with that, have everything to do with the fact that if you give people the opportunity to sort of to, to create their own world or to, or to, or to, um, to play within a system, then they will. And so the last uh, a case study I'm going to show you is an example of that for the fuel band. And I'm going to sit down and have a drink because I'm as dry as a nun's nasty. There you go. <laughs> You're on, James. <clears throat> So I'll play a quick video now that's uh, a very real demonstration of what we mean by play. It's okay, I'm good. Let's go! Thanks for coming. Welcome to the Nike Fuel Fest. Yeah, yeah, we bring the stars out. We bring the women and the cars and the cars out. Let's have a total celebration, get a glass Boys out. Versus girls. Who's got more energy? Let it play, let it go away. Yeah. We won't come down. Get your fuel pants in the air, come on. Yeah, cars out. Yeah, I'm in Magnetic charge now. Man. I'm a star, man. I'm a now. I live a very, very, very wild lifestyle. Heidi and Audrina eat your heart out. I used to listen to you, don't wanna bring arms out. I've got so many clothes, I keep some in my aunt's house. Disturbing London, baby, we about to branch out. Soon I'll be the king like Prince Charles. Yeah, yeah. Tiny yeah. Tiny yeah. Tiny and Table and my dresser, CLC compressor, just in case that don't impress her. Say hello to Dexter, say hello to Uncle Vesta. Got him gazing at my necklace and my crazy sun protectors. Check out my visual, check out my audio, extra audio. Yeah, we bring the stars out, we bring the women in the cars out. Let's have a total celebration, get a glass out. And we can do this until we pass out. Let it play, 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 let it So that, that is the last video that we'll be playing uh, this morning. Um, but I think this is a very good example of how this sort of model comes together as one. Uh, our job with this is looking at the, uh, the intersection between engaging an audience and then actually sort of converting them into an active user of the fuel band. Uh, from an audience perspective, obviously we're looking at information and, and, uh, and uh, actually sort of entertainment and then demonstration of the product. So in this case, we took over a power station and we hosted a gig uh, for 4,000 people. That provides the entertainment. The demonstration comes in the fact that we're actually going to get them using the fuel band in real time and actually help them understand that the more you do, the more it counts. Converting them into the user actually happened before the event in this case by giving them each a fuel band. We activated their Nike Plus accounts at retail. So all they had to do was wear it on the night. And we basically got all of those 4,000 people working in real time. So we'd, we'd already achieved this, uh, this sense of getting the audience captivated and getting the users um, engaged and, and enabled. And then we just had to focus on participation. And what we did, instead of that just being a gig, was actually getting the three different sets from Zane Lowe to Magnetic Man's Tiny Temper to really get people to dance. The more dance, the more you dance, the more fuel points you earn, and the more you understand that everything you do counts. And that's sort of instigating that new behavioral change we're looking to do uh, around the fuel band. And the participation is, is key, uh, because we basically then get sort of motivation going, which is the backbone of everything we do for Nike, which is helping you sort of uh, go guys versus girls, top fuel earners. And from a media perspective, what we're doing is, is as that's going on, each fuel band is synced up to their account. Their accounts are synced up to their Twitter profiles, their Facebook profiles. So each unique piece of activity has been broadcast through the internet in real time. So we're getting that knock-on effect of, of awareness and participation. At the same time, as you saw, we turned the fuel station itself into basically like a live billboard. All around the fuel station, you, uh, the, uh, the power station, you're seeing live stats projected from individuals as well as total fuel points earned. So really focused on this idea of a game, and the game was the motivation to drive people to participate and understand the fuel band. 
And that is the close uh, for the model that we use to uh, activate products, services, and communications. And with that, <laughs> <laughs> any questions? I have a question. And then if, if anybody has a question, I'll come to you. So get your questions ready. My question is, I mean, this is great. And it was you know, a cool event. And they got the people excited. And they got involved. How do you? It, how do you introduce traditional media into that or not? In other words, Nike obviously has lots of different things they're doing. Is this just one bit, or how do you actually get it into the other? I mean, does it show up in a print ad? Does it show up in a radio? Does it show up in billboards? This, or is this? Yeah, I mean, the, if you look at the uh, the allocation of sort of marketing yeah. resources, I think that in the industry generally it's shifting away from more traditional to uh, so to to the sort of service layer and more engaging. And just you know, where people are, which is in digital channels. Uh, in this instance, the last thing that was done was a TV spot, or oh, well, reception of the, the uh, event. Mm. That, in fact, the, the, the genesis of the TV spot was, um, the, so it took two years for, the, for us to de help develop the fuel ban and, and the experience. Right. Right. And very early in that, uh, in that experience, we created this little video to help explain internally at Nike what the idea around the fuel ban was. And that, and that is actually pretty close to what you saw really? as, as, as a, a TV, TV spot, yeah. right? So, huh. so it, you know, but it was only once we had the experience that we understood what we wanted to say. Right. So as far as, as uh, uh, traditional media's role, it was to explain um, what we made as opposed to making feel people right. just feel good about right. a brand. It just seems to me, you know, James, that it's like, you know, for a Nike, for a brand like that, which is all about experience and sport and doing it, I mean, just do it, all that kind of stuff, yeah. that it's perfect to have experiences. But it doesn't work for all brands. So is it, is it, are we really talking about only certain kinds of brands? Or how does it? I think, I mean, Nike's obviously in a privileged position because they're, they're looking to sort of drive understanding of performance. Um, we certainly, it's not for every single brand. We work um, uh, with people like uh, uh, Beats by Dre, Unilever, we're doing a piece of work for uh, Rexona at the moment <coughs> around Do More, mm. uh, where we're actually sort of like helping use social media to drive participation and understanding mm. what Do More means as yeah, it pertains yeah. to their product. Yeah. Um, so we can sort of find a way, but it's sort of understanding the, the balance, so you're not forcing it and imposing it upon a brand where it just doesn't make sense. Right. I think the other point from your initial question around media in this case is, we really wanted to activate the, the p sort of folks online around the idea of making it count. Mm -hmm. And it was that behavioral change. And in this case, we're just uh, giving a live demonstration of that. And so the interesting thing that's happened now is the campaign has sort of been and gone. The, the Olympics is naturally over. Right. But people now are associating counts, make it counts, everything counts with all their sporting activity, whether they're a Nike sort of uh, customer or not. Mm -hmm. And that's been sort of a profound understanding of what this is all about and you know, how it ties back to that brand. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. Um, I've been told that we don't have a lot of time for questions. So if you have questions, could you please stay for lunch and we'll, 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 you'll have to t talk to Nick and James then. But in the interim, could you please join me in thanking Nick and James from RGA. Thank you.